Hello, everyone, and welcome to Asian Pacific Voices Radio Podcast, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our communities. I'm your host, Rasha Goal, and today I am excited to introduce a celebrated American graphic artist and cartoonist, also an award-winning author and illustrator of Kiss and Tell, a romantic resume ages 0 to 22. Known for their evocative autobiographical comics and dedication to promoting underrepresented voices, their raw and intimate storytelling has captivated readers worldwide, while their creation of three online databases has empowered countless fellow cartoonists. It is my pleasure to welcome Mari Naomi on Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Mari, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> It is my pleasure. We have so much to talk about, so we're going to get started right away. Let's start off talking about the influence of the Japanese culture um, as, you, as your Japanese-American heritage and how that's played a part on your art. How do you think it's um, influenced your visual style, your storytelling, and the themes that you explore in your work? Well, given that I'm Japanese-American and I write memoir, it uh, it's pretty much just so sewn into who I am and all my writing that I just, I can't really separate it from the other parts of me uh, most of the time. Specifically when it comes to my writing, uh, you know, I've been doing this since the 90s and a lot has changed over that time. And there was a time not that long ago where I feel like I was discouraged from writing about race and ethnicity and that sort of thing. And uh, that changed a lot when the movie Crazy Rich Asians came out. And suddenly that's all people wanted me to write about. And being a bit of an anti-authoritarian, um, I always want to do exactly what people don't want me to do. <laughs> um, and I think that influences my writing more than anything else, if you think about it. Um, but, but it's woven in there. I can't get away from it. Uh, visually, I honestly didn't grow up with a lot of uh, influence besides my mother, who's Japanese, and her um, aesthetic style. I don't think that things like manga and anime, anime have anything to do with my visual style. I'm more uh, inspired by the American Underground cartoon comics. And just just things that have grabbed me along the way, uh, artists, you know, from forever ago. Uh, Edward Gorey was someone that I really loved uh, my entire life. So it, it's really all over the place. I'm very fusion. <laughs> That's my answer. I love the fusion. Um, and I think that fusion has helped po possibly create all the diverse work that you've created because you have a lot of different themes that you explore. Let's talk about... I thought you loved me because now this one delves into the complexities of identity and relationships and you, you know, focusing on a lost best friend, share some insights onto um, why this theme was relevant and important for you to share. And were there any specific moments that were very touching for you that you wanted to really convey to the audiences? Well, I thought you loved me. Um, this is my ninth book and um, I, I think it's my fourth memoir, fifth memoir. And it was very differently done than my others in that I used collage and old mem memorabilia, uh, it photos, prose, and comics to tell the story. Uh, I think I use these specific things because recently, with the invention of the iPad, which is what I'm talking to you from right now, uh, it, a collage has become very... Um, accessible to me. It's a lot easier to take my own photos and, and scale them, etc., and, and just play around with it. Um, but the, the concept of the book came, it's something that I've been brooding on for just decades. Uh, this friend I had in my formative years, I lost her friendship and I just never got over it. And uh, we stopped being friends in my 20s. And by my 40s, I thought, you know, I've got to get over this somehow. And uh, I tell people if I'd had a therapist, this book wouldn't exist right now. Um, but since I did not at the time have a therapist, I was sort of working out my own stuff uh, through the book. And by the time I was writing this book, I'd written another, uh, another uh, book called I Thought You hated me which was another female friendship and that was 
Uh, it's a very different book. I regret naming it so similarly. <laughs> but the, uh, for a long time, I've just felt like friendships were not something that were explored enough in media, uh, but they're so important. I mean, so much media just really focuses on romantic relationship or familiar relationship, but friendship is so important. And I just, I, I decided to be the change I wanted to see in the world. And amazingly, I've been reading all this great friendship literature lately. Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that this is something that's changing a little bit, but, um, but part of it is I just really want to write about friendship. I wanted to get over this friend and, um, that's why I wrote the book when I did, uh, as far as anything that like, like surprising moments, I was writing the book as certain events were unfolding and well, they're very, there's some twists and turns and those are the surprising moments, but I don't want to give any spoilers in case anyone wants to read the book. <laughs> Love it. I have to ask you though. So do you feel in writing this book at this moment in time, were you able to have closure with that friendship? Yes and no. I don't believe that closure is a real thing completely. But yes, I'm really glad I wrote the book. Um, but I don't feel that writing the book was what gave me closure. <laughs> mm. But read the book and you'll see why. <laughs> yes, I'm intrigued now, Mari. And I, and I love that you talked about the topic of friendships, because I think especially with females, that is such an integral part of our lives. And you're right, we, we don't talk about it enough. And I think all of us well, I can't generalize, but I mean, I've experienced the losses of girlfriends that have come and gone in my life and it's been very impactful. So thank you for sharing that. Now you've also had right pieces that have also been considered controversial. So I understand you have a graphic novel that was, uh, that recently faced a ban in Texas. Let's talk about that controversy. Um, why was it considered controversial and how has that impacted you as an author, as a creator? Well, so I found out that the book was banned. It's book one in, out of a trilogy, and the book is called Losing the Girl, and the trilogy is called um, Lost Life on Earth, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I found out about it through the LA Times, who wrote about it, um, just as I was starting to give up on the industry and give up on comics in general, because uh, the pandemic had kind of killed my career, honestly. And... I just didn't, I felt like I could keep going, but I didn't want to start from scratch and that's what was going to happen. And then I swear within the week, I got information about this ban. And because the LA Times wrote about it, that put these books back in print, which was amazing. So um, thank you, Katie Texas, for banning my book. Um, but also I'm very mad at Katie Texas for banning my book. And I know that most people whose books are banned don't get written about in the LA Times. So I feel extremely mixed feelings about this. Um, obviously, book banning sucks. I'm, I, my feelings were extremely hurt. I'm originally from Texas, so it felt extremely personal. I don't, I mean, there are controversial things. I feel like life is controversial. Uh, people like to insert politics into everything. Just the mere fact that I am a biracial person is controversial to some people. The fact that I am non-binary. The fact that I am attracted to all genders, that is considered controversial. Just who I am, which I feel like has nothing to do with anybody else, that is controversial. According to the LA Times, my book was banned for queer content. Um, ironically, there is no queer content in book one. Those all appear in book two and three, the books that were not banned in the series. So I couldn't tell you exactly why the book was banned. It's possible she just Googled my name and saw that I run the queer comics database, uh, cartoonist database, and thought queer comics. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. There is an interracial relationship in there. There's an abortion in there. Um, there's very in indications of very awkward sex in there. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> it could be anything. But according to the LA Times, it was the queer content. Hmm. That's interesting. And, well, and speaking of queer content, your databases, cartoonists of color, queer cartoonists, and disabled cartoonists. 
They aim to amplify underrepresented voices in the comic industry. I don't think this is something very common that we see. So what inspired you to create these resources? Uh, what impact have they had? And maybe what kind of reactions have you received from artists? Uh, so it was in the, at the end of 2014, and I was doing some research for an article where I was looking up uh, cartoonists of color and Google gave me absolutely no information. I, I had the friends that I'd made in the industry over a period of years, but that was maybe a dozen or a couple dozen people. And I knew of maybe 30 or 40 people, uh, but I, I really wanted to know more. And when I was unable to find anything, I, I went to social media and um, just crowdsourced. Soon uh, I had over a hundred names and I, so many names that I had to put them in a spreadsheet to keep everyone uh, sorted. And after a while I thought, wow, there really should be a database of this. Why isn't there a database? And then it occurred to me that I had the information and that became my responsibility to put that online. And thus my life was ruined. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and but today there are thousands of people in the database and uh, it's just something that I just kept going with. Uh, after I did the cartoonist of color, once I had it figured out, I thought, okay, well, I want a queer cartoonist database. And uh, in 2018, I started a dis disabled cartoonist database. Um, I am not disabled at the moment, but I have friends who inspired me that I thought, well, this, this should really be a thing. And, uh, and that's why I do it. I don't make any money off of it. I don't farm anyone's information. Like this is all just something that I do to be nice and put good stuff in the world. Um, but it was, it's very frustrating to me when people say, you know, why is your panel made of all white men? And they say, well, there's no woman cartoonist. So there's no cartoonist of color. And you know, originally I did this so I could just put it on a plate and say, yes, there are, here they are. Um, and here's their contact info if you'd like to invite them on your panel, etc. And um, that's exactly what's come out of it over the years is uh, people having just a card, uh, the ace to pull down on the table and say, yes, there are cartoons of color. Here they are. Um, and from what I understand, now it's really hard to, to quantify, you know, what it's done, but I have heard from people pretty much every time I do any kind of public event, someone comes up to me and says like, look, I got my first book deal from the databases or, or thanks for the databases. I've populated my bookstore with people in them. I mean, and you know, it's super heartwarming. It was a whole lot of work, but, uh, but just every time I hear something like that, I think, okay, well I could do this for another year, um, or another year. So it's, it's almost been 10 years. Um, and I say that I'll keep doing it until I either run out of money or it doesn't need to be done anymore. And hopefully I don't run out of money and I don't see it ending anytime soon, unfortunately. <laughs> Mari, that just sounds so fulfilling to me. Like I, I can imagine if I was in that space, I mean, what a beautiful resource to have, especially creating something that isn't out there and really helping artists across the board. So I thank you for creating that. I'm excited to check out the databases even more. Um, I think it's, it's incredible what you've created. So thank you for that. How well, do you, thanks. how do you envision, of course, how do you envision the future of representation in the comic industry? I'm sure like some of our other artistic industries, it has its ups and downs. So what changes are you hoping to see? Um, and how do you think platforms like cartoonists of color, queer cartoonists and disabled cartoonists can contribute to this progress? I feel like it's, it's happening. It's happened. And I just want to continue to see it happen. Um, and, and don't get me wrong. I don't want, only cartoonists of color to be uh, to be published. I want everyone to to have their voice heard. Um, this is one of the pushbacks I've gotten specifically from white male cartoonists who are straight and cis and don't appreciate the databases because they feel like they're getting edged out. Uh, that is not my intention. I just want everyone to be able to get you know have a seat at the table 
And I do see that happening. And I can't say it's because of the databases, but I think the database really, my databases really facilitate that. It, it helps ease us in. Um, the things that were really culturally impactful are, you know, Crazy Rich Asians or, you know, the movies like Nope or, you know, just just the whole society, our, our cultural like and media diversifying, I think that's what's really pushing the change. But I just want to help edge it along. Um, but sure, there was there have been times where I thought, oh, I've I've done what I intended to do when I saw uh, a young queer person of color uh, get a six figure deal. I'm like, okay, my work here is done. But then I'm like, wait, I want all young queer people of color to have a six figure deal. Uh, I would like a six figure deal. So <laughs> let's just keep this going. Um, but I, it's so much better than it was when I started it. And I just, I, I mean, onward and upwards. I, I, I just want more comics in the world. And I want it to honestly to be easier to find other comics. And, uh, and I and I think databases are, are a way to do that. Because um, you can look up genres, you can look up kinds of people that you're interested in following. I mean, there's so many ways. Um, and I feel like this, this, I mean, publishing as, as an industry is kind of a mess. Um, but I think community is going to save us and things like databases or anything that can connect us, especially when there aren't ulterior motives, such as, you know, billionaires buying social media sites up, um, you know, anything that's really out there for the community and not to benefit one specific person or a small group of rich people. Um, I think that could only be helpful. Yes. We all Mari, have to preach. do this together. <laughs> preach. And it's, it's, it's about community. Absolutely. Like you said, I have to jump back and ask you about uh, turning Japanese. That's another memoir of yours. And you kind of went and shared your experiences uh, with the adult entertainment industry. So was there any res in San Francisco? So what made you decide to share this? Uh, did you have any reservations along the way? Well, this is a memoir I started drawing in 2009. And it, uh, it was originally published in 2015. And it just got re-released um, through Oni Press. So this is this is kind of an old work, uh, and honestly, when I was so the work itself was, uh, I guess it's adult entertainment. I worked worked at Hostess bars uh, in San Jose and then in Tokyo, and I wrote about it in in this memoir. Um, and I also the memoir is also about me trying to connect with my Japanese roots, which I felt very disconnected from growing up, and uh, the, the the kind of challenges I got when I was doing that is I did want to t at the time talk about my ethnicity more and I and just the race aspects and cultural gaps and I didn't feel like that was very welcome in the publishing industry at that time um, I feel like it's a lot more uh, people are a lot more open to that sort of thing now and so now it's like a great time to re-release it I feel really lucky that it's getting a re-release honestly I had no reservations about writing it uh, because I was young and um, carefree <laughs> and didn't know that the world could stamp me down yet. Uh, just kidding, I knew. And um, <laughs> uh, but, but when I took the job hostessing, I didn't write comics yet. I didn't know that I wanted to do memoir yet, but I thought it was so interesting that I thought, maybe I'll write about this someday. And that was one of the, just an impetus for me to try something new and interesting at the time, but I thought I would grow up to write novels. So <laughs> I love that you were able to share that and that you're brutally, you're honest. In fact, your work has been described as unflinchingly honest. So how do you balance the need of honesty versus how much you want to share in your storytelling and then thinking about the potential impact that it could have on the readers or people that are um, plugging into your material? I don't know how honest I am exactly. Um, I, I mean, as a person, I never lie. And in storytelling, you have to do quite a bit of backbending to protect the people who are in the story. Um, but my general feeling about when I'm writing about my life when other people are involved is to tell my secrets and protect the secrets of others. 
sometimes those secrets intertwine with my own and I have to make a judgment call. And sometimes I've messed up and I've told too much. And, uh, but the, but the problem is there is no right and wrong when it comes to writing about other people. And I've had numerous occasions where I thought I was going too far and, th and I wasn't, or I, uh, or someone said, yes, yeah, sure. Write about this. And then 10 years later, they were upset about it. But then five years later, they were fine about it. So, you know, people's feelings about that sort of thing can fluctuate and, my takeaway as someone I'm turning 50 in a couple of weeks and, and like I've been doing this for so long, my takeaway is that uh, don't think about it. Um, and if they're still important to you, show it to them before it goes to print. And if there's problems, work it out beforehand. Uh, and, but just, just be mindful. Um, you know, I, I obviously don't want to hurt my mom's feelings. And so I don't, so with her, I'm very careful and I, she's extremely private and so before I write a story about her, I always, you know, before I put it out there, I always show it to her and say, mom, is this okay? Um, you know, I just, I just want to be, be nice to people. <laughs> well, that, that's a very kind thing to do and happy early birthday, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to ask you also, uh, um, if you could talk to us a little bit about the creation and significance of the Stop AAPI Hate mural that you created in Garvey Park in Rosemead, California. What was the message that you were uh, aiming to convey through this project? So Task Force, uh, which is the person who hired me to do, to do this job, they reached out to me through a person by DM on Instagram. And I thought I was being scammed. <laughs> it was in the middle of the pandemic. There was no vaccine out yet. I was in the middle of a horrible situation that I'm struggling to write about now. And, uh, and I thought I had a Nigerian prince on my hands. And, but also, I was like, sure, I need the work. <laughs> so for the course of a few weeks, I was talking to this one person who I didn't know ex whether she actually existed or not. And she was feeding me information from her bosses uh, at LA healthcare. And they said, you know, this is going to go out, to, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of flyers throughout the city. Um, we pasted everywhere. Um, it's going to go on. I think, I think it's on like four murals in Los Angeles. Uh, one of them is 150 feet across. This all sounded like BS to me, but I thought, okay, well, I, I need to practice. Why not? Maybe it's real. And she, I, I believe she said, we want to end racism. Can you help us uh, make a comic that'll help end racism? I'm like, sure, that sounds easy. Uh, and they wanted to get the word out about, it. it's called 211, which was basically just a number you could call to report hate incidents, not hate crimes, but hate incidents. So that was, those were my objectives was to end racism and get the message out for this two on one thing, which sounded amazing. I had had numerous hate incidents directed at me during the pandemic, um, towards what I, I definitely know at least one of them was because I'm Asian and I suspect multiple were. So, um, and I never reported any of those. And so I was on board with this idea. And uh, we worked together. Uh, it's the first time I worked with a government. Um, so there was a lot of bureaucracy. There was a lot of backs and forths. And, uh, and we just worked back and forth. And then I actually didn't know. I, I kept waiting for them to ask for my bank account number, which they eventually did. And I'm like, okay, here it is. Here's where I get scammed. And, um, but then they deposited the money. And then there was the dedication ceremony and I was invited to it. And it was one of the first things I did coming out of the pan, well, not out of the pandemic, but once the first, one of the first times I came out into a crowd in the pandemic after years and I was terrified and there's, I'm surrounded by photographers and the, the newspapers and, or whatever you call them now, journalists. I was surrounded by uh, politicians and, and Asian people, it was so amazing. I was crying and I'm like, oh, yay, this isn't a scam. And look, my, my art is actually on this mural. It was a very surreal experience. Um, and 
it was it was very hard um not because i thought i was being scammed but it was very hard to work with so many people on a project and um and also the time i was going through at the time all the things i was going through uh, this was right before i found out that my work had been banned and i thought my career was done like i was going through all this other personal stuff at this point um and also the pandemic and i was also having a nervous breakdown so there's a lot of stuff going on and it was super healing to actually be with my Asian siblings, you know, all, you know, thousands or not thousands, but hundreds of them. And then over the course of time, even now still having people tag me in their Instagram posts and say, you know, I feel seen. Um, my, my, my way of solving racism, the only way I know how to do that is to tell my own story and hope that people connect with it. And so that was what was behind it, which is I feel scared, but I feel like I have to keep going to honor the people who kept going before me. And that was my my message. Um, and I think it resonated with some people and that felt still feels amazing. That's the story. <laughs> No, what a beautiful thing. And you mentioned career there. So I wanted to, to, talk, to talk to you too, but for people who are maybe in this industry or interested, where do you see the trend going now when we look at graphic memoirs and comics? How is this world evolving? Where do you see things going? Rasha, I have no idea. We are in such a flux right now. I thought the next step up would be I don't, I don't even know. I don't know. I've, I've done nine books so far and I, I have another book finished and I would like to do more art. Um, I don't know if, if that involves comics, the publishing industry is such a nightmare. Also the entertainment industry in general is so scary. Like it, and now with the introduction of AI will take your jobs. Like, I just don't know. Um, I know on a personal level, I want to keep connecting with people and telling stories and sharing stories and encouraging people to tell their stories because that's what feeds me, nourishes me. But as far as what I'm going to be making money with in the next five, 10 years, I have no clue. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I think it's so unpredictable right now uh, with the, the with the times we're going through. Like you said, with the entertainment industry, same thing. So it, it's a very... It's a very challenging time and it shall hopefully pass soon too, but um, something to think about. And we're almost out of time here. So I'd love to ask you, is there anything else you'd like to share with your fans? Something else you're working on or um, yeah, anything exciting happening for you at this time? I mean, my next project, I, I, I it's actually a collaboration with Trung Le Nguyen, who wrote the wrote and drew The Magic Fish, which is one of the most amazing graphic novels for young adults I've ever read. Uh, he and I collaborated. He's going to be drawing what I wrote, um, and that uh, it's a middle grade book that comes out in 2026. So that's down the line. I, I do want to tell my readers, many of who are young cartoonists, um, you know, I just want to give the adv unsolicited advice to just don't pay attention to trends. Don't look at what's happening in the industry. If you want to make art. Make the art that you want to make. Don't try to predict what other people want to see um, because ultimately that's why you make art is to express yourself and to enjoy yourself. And, um, and you cannot predict what's going to make money and what isn't. I love that piece of advice. Thank you. Well, I want to thank our guest, Mari Naomi, for being on our show today and sharing their experience and advice and words of wisdom with us. And uh, Mari, where can people find you on social media? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's the question of the century. I'm most places right now except Twitter. Uh, but, uh, but really, uh, if you want to support me, I'm on Patreon under Patreon slash Mari Naomi, where I show works in progress. And I have almost daily diary comics that I've been publishing since 2014. Um, and that's a great way to connect to me with me or my website, Mari Naomi.com, where you can also find links to all my databases. And, um, if you identify as a cartoonist of color, a queer cartoonist, or a disabled cartoonist, you are more than welcome to submit your information. I, I approve them all, but I approve almost everything, unless you're just, you know, 
not of cartoonists of color and you're trying to sneak in, I won't approve that. But um, please join us. Please join the community. Um, and you can be contacted by people or not, uh, but just like add your name to the list so that people know that you're there and that you can inspire other people or you can gain fans or peruse the databases so you can find new people to connect with. Um, that's, that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's lots of places that they can connect with you on. Thank you for joining us today, Mari. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> And now we'd also love to hear from you, all of our valued and devoted listeners, about any suggestions you may have on future guests or topics. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, um, uh, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And remember, Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our Asian and Pacific Islander communities with a voice through media arts. If you'd like to support our program, please do visit us at Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Radio.com. Once again, I'm Rasha Goel. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget to join us next week for another thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Have a great week.